Welcome to the session on scaling financial innovations uh, for the SDGs. Uh, we have a um, very exciting 90 minutes ahead, um, which will include a uh, live stream of a discussion on financial innovation for the first 30 minutes, breakout groups for 30 minutes, and then a report out. We want to be as action oriented uh, as possible. And I encourage, I encourage everyone to come out with concrete proposals that can be followed up. Just to set the scene for a minute, uh, I think we all are aware that COVID-19 has caused the withdrawal of at least $700 billion of private investment in emerging and developing countries uh, just this year in 2020. What we want to look at is how can innovative financing solutions encourage capital back into developing economies to support their SDG agendas and close the investment gap. We'll focus on private investment and innovative product solutions, domestic investment capacity, regional innovation trends, and industrial revolution technology for inclusive finance. But uh, to kick us off, it's uh, a great delight that we have a recorded message from His Excellency, the President um, of Ghana, Nana Akufo Addo, and let's go straight into that, if we may. I thank the World Economic Forum for the opportunity to be part of this summit and to deliver these remarks on, quote, scaling financial in innovations for the SDGs, unquote. For the first time, this summit is being held fully virtual. This is a clear indication of how much our world, our lives, and our ways of doing business have been impacted by the deadly coronavirus pandemic that continues to wreak havoc on lives and livelihoods. The new normal that we find ourselves in is yet another manifestation that we cannot continue to stick to the traditional ways of doing things. And this is true when it comes to financing the SDGs. It bears repeating that there may have been many discussions on finding innovative financing methods for the SDGs, but doing so in the midst of such a devastating global pandemic is definitely new. And this presents us with a fresh opportunity to reflect deeply and examine critically how we can smartly and innovatively raise the needed resources to build the world we want. The pandemic has indeed provoked a great assault on the SDGs and has eroded some of the gains the world has made over the past five years since the inception of Agenda 2030. Job losses, loss of income, decline in GDP, depletion of household assets and widening inequalities are but a few of the negative impacts of the pandemic on the SDGs. Crucially, the pandemic has exacerbated the already huge gaps that many developing countries faced in financing the goals. Some $700 billion is reported to have been withdrawn from emerging and developing markets, destabilizing growth and revenue mobilization potentials, and further undermining prospects for achieving the SDGs. One important development is that the pandemic is decisively redefining the global financial and economic architecture and country growth ambitions. And we're still not certain when this will all be over. But it is in these challenging times that the SDGs assume an even greater importance. Our response to the pandemic cannot be delinked from actions on the SDGs. For achieving the SDGs, will put our world on a solid foundation and a firm path to addressing global health risks and emerging infectious diseases and in building resilient and inclusive societies. Even under the best of circumstances, it is abundantly clear that traditional sources of financing were going to be woefully inadequate to support the achievement of the goals. This is confirmed in a report by the High-Level Panel on Global Sustainability, 
which makes the case that, and I quote, the scale of investment, innovation, resources, technological development, and employment creation required for sustainable development and poverty eradication is beyond the range of the public sector, unquote. And as such, one of the keys to success of the SDGs is innovative financing. We must therefore be innovative in finding the needed resources to tackle the world's most pressing needs. And we must do so at pace and to scale. We must be creative in looking for and in scaling up new and innovative ways of mobilizing resources. But innovative financial flows are not just going to happen. The fundamental prerequisites must first be put in place. And this must include a solid partnership between the government and the private sector in devising appropriate strategies to leverage such financing. It is in the spirit of such an approach that Ghana has entered into a partnership with the World Economics Forum's Sustainable Development Investment Partnership, SDIP, to develop an SDG's country financing roadmap to unlock capital to bridge the SDG's financing gap. This partnership represents a strong tool to identify the bottlenecks and impediments that hinder financing for the SDGs in the country, enabling us to overcome the barriers that undermine achievement of the SDGs and thereby help build a society that leaves no one behind. We've also engaged the private sector in Ghana to create an SDGs delivery fund to support government's efforts in implementing this all-important agenda. This fund, sourced solely from private sector contributions, would be used to undertake concrete actions in good health and well-being, quality education, clean water and sanitation, clean and affordable energy, amongst others. As we seek to scale up sources of innovative yes. funding, needed to tackle illicit financial flows. Africa alone loses over 50 billion United States dollars each year through illicit financial flows. This is significantly higher than what the continent receives in overseas development assistance, and it represents a huge hemorrhage of resources away from development financing possibilities. I mean, the huge decrease in resources caused by the pandemic, we have a pressing need and a shared responsibility to stamp out illicit financial flows once and for all. Achieving the SDGs is a must. We owe this as a duty to current and future generations on which we cannot compromise. Indeed, the resources required to implement fully the SDGs are huge. But I'm convinced that once we put our collective minds to it and pool our talents together, we will succeed in building the world we want. It is my hope that the outcome of this summit will be a game changer towards SDGs financing so that together we can deliver on this historic and seminal agenda. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I think the um, president of Ghana has, has kicked us off uh, with a challenge. Uh, we need game changers to transform uh, the way of doing innovative finance. We cannot stick to the traditional way of doing things, he said. And we will come back to that theme when we get to the panel and the breakout groups, but first, we want to do a very quick poll and perhaps uh, we can put the slide up uh, on the poll to look at what, uh, what it is that matters most to participants when it comes to achieving sustainable development. So if you could vote now, we all get a vote. And then we will see the results. If you feel none of those boxes fit you and you want to say all three, you're forced to make a choice. Uh, 
Okay, um, that was a very quick poll. 35% economic return, 51% social return, 42% environmental return. And I'm sure uh, as we look at innovative finance, uh, we're gonna see where, where certain initiatives uh, fall on that, on that spectrum. So uh, let me just take a minute to set the scene before we get into, um, into the panel. Um, the, um, the president of Ghana reminded us of um, where we've come from. And I think it's worth remembering that in 2015 at the Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa, we, we or the community launched the phrase billions to trillions uh, in terms of mobilizing finance uh, for development and particularly in terms of mobilizing much more private finance. Sadly, um, billions to trillions has not materialized. And indeed, as the president of Ghana said, 700 billion has flown out um, during COVID-19. So as we go forward, it's clear that emerging and developing countries are facing an unprecedented combination of the health crisis through COVID-19, uh, global risk aversion, and uh, the recession, the global recession that all have spoken about, they have very high levels of debt to beat GDP ratios. They lack the resources, as the president of Ghana reminded us, to finance recovery. So the question for us is what are those innovative mechanisms? We've talked a lot in the past about blended finance. We've talked a lot about first loss guarantees. We've, we've gone through a whole spectrum of approaches, green bonds, social bonds. Um, are these the ways forward? Are there other ways forward that we haven't thought of? Are there new, um, new ways of persuading private capital or de-risking for private capital so we can reverse those flows? Um, I'm joined, I'm delighted to be joined here um, by two experts on this subject. First, Karen Finkelston, who is the vice president for Partnerships, Communications, and Outreach at the International Finance Corpor Corporation. Welcome, Karen. And then Marc-Henri Blanchard, who is Executive Vice President and Head of CB CDBQ Global, Caisse des Depots et Placements du Québec. Um, and we, um, we have about um, 15 minutes. So let me kick off immediately with a question, Karen, to you. Um, what can, I mean, the basic $64,000 question, what can public and private actors in that development finance ecosystem do to enable more capital flows in developing and emerging economies? You, you look at this every day at IFC. Um, what are your thoughts about next steps? Thanks, Caroline, and uh, it's an honor to be here today with you and with Marc-Andre. Um, and I, this is a topic you're right, we do talk about every day. And I think the numbers of uh, private investment uh, dollars leaving emerging markets are huge, as you mentioned, and, and um, the esteemed leader from Ghana mentioned. I think the other part of this is that ODA appears in early numbers from what we've seen from OECD seems to be uh, shrinking as well. As we know, many countries link their ODA to their GNI and that, um, it, you know, in many developed countries obviously is dropping uh, due to the COVID uh, situation. So we have a, a, a sort of double hit here and I think it really uh, behooves the public and private sector to work uh, together on these issues as, as you noted, as was, you know, envisioned in a whole different environment in, in Addis. And I think what uh, we see um, as being two things to, that I'll talk about. First is our COVID response, which has really been around relief. Um, as a bank group, we're looking to put about 160 billion into emerging markets, our, our developing country um, clients by uh, June 2021. And for 47 billion of that will be coming from IFC. Um, the second phase from an IFC perspective on the private sector is really looking at more systemic sector initiatives. Uh, where we're actually trying to help in areas such as global health that the um, leader from Ghana mentioned, which is really around supporting PPE and vaccines when they're available, as well as supporting health service providers in developing countries um, so that they can get affordable access to these uh, goods and that we can help uh, 
ensure that that's coming, even from part one companies, which is quite new for us. We're looking at textiles, we're looking at tourism, about areas that, um, sectors that involve uh, a lot of employment in uh, emerging markets, as well as especially women's employment. So how can we intervene in a way that is more systemic across regions, across countries? Uh, the other area we're looking at is uh, restructuring funds, um, both on the equity side through our asset management company, and on the debt side uh, with the possible instruments to help um, corporates to restructure and possibly across sectors for restructuring. So these are things that we're discussing. The first of which that came out is, uh, is the global health platform, which is a $4 billion platform. Um, I think what we see as being huge though to the, how we bring private sector back is um, the rebuild period. How are we going to make it possible um, for the trillions which are in global markets still to really be um, able to look at where could that money go to solve problems and, so, and, and meet the SDGs. Um, given that private sector, much of the money has gone home to solve problems in, in, in home countries, how do we re-attract private investors back? And I think when we look at our goals as IFC last year and the year before, we, we mobilized about $10 billion worth of private capital alongside of our own about $11 billion of financing to our fiscal year end in June. Now, what we're hoping to do or what our goal is by 2030 is that that number of mobilization would grow to 23 billion. And, and the way we see um, this happening is, you know, there are traditional, you know, uh, syndications that we're doing. We have our managed co-lending uh, portfolio platform. We just closed another um, iteration of that to support banks globally and, and financial institutions. Um, and that's taking um, insurance, pension funds to come in to support uh, kind of pre-mobilized money that can come with us into providing debt into these uh, financial institutions. In addition to that, um, we've really ramped up our social and green bond um, programs. Um, I think the, the social bond uh, issuance this year globally is up 250%, which really shows that markets are interested and, and ultimately asset owners are interested in what their money is doing in the midst of this crisis, in addition to the returns that they're getting, which is sort of uh, borne out by the by the uh, the poll you did at the beginning. Um, it's not just returns, but it's also what's the social impact. Now, for us, we issued the largest social bond ever um, in in March, a billion dollar bond, uh, and we also. Um, have been focusing on how do we issue more social bonds in emerging markets. So we issued the first green bond in Indonesia um, in the past year, and we also issued the first gender bond. So trying to not just do this on a global basis, but really start to work with emerging market players uh, to get them issuing in their own markets, and then obviously using the proceeds to support projects that will meet social objectives and the SDGs in their markets. I think when we look at what we see as um, really new and innovative on our side and is something that we've been working toward over the past uh, three or four years, which is this, how do we actually start to craft and develop projects to solve the issue of where the trillions are going? I, I see this as kind of a two-sided discussion. We need to figure out, and this is where we worked on the impact principles. How do we get investors looking at what impact really means? And our impact principles now have over a hundred signatories. Um, I think a third of which have signed up during the COVID period. So that shows again, an interest from um, asset managers, asset owners in demonstrating that they are actually looking at you know, impact in addition to financial return. But again, what the social bonds demand, what the green bonds demand, what the impact principles demand is that the, there's somewhere to put those uh, dollars and um, that currency to allow uh, problems to be solved. And what we're seeing is that you know, governments are stretched and we're hearing from, as we did from, from Ghana, the, the need for the private sector, but do you know, the capacity in the health crisis to actually go out and do feasibility studies for these projects and develop the projects is limited. I think also international companies, regional companies are also stretched facing their own challenges for COVID. So what we are looking to do and we call it upstream, but what it really is, is project development. And we often look at what the World Bank did years ago when they moved into lower income countries, which is you know, really working with the countries to develop the projects. Now we wanna do that at IFC and with other development finance institutions on the private sector side. So I think some of you have heard that we've hired about 200 people, many of whom will be 
based uh, eventually in Africa to actually start doing that work. Uh, and these people are not traditional bankers or private equity people. We've hired people who were actual project developers who've worked in innovative uh, roles to, to work with government. And I think what's also powerful about this is we're going to try to also um, work much more closely with the World Bank so that all of these development policy loans and operations that they're working with countries on will actually start to work on what are the reforms needed in key sectors that could bring the private sector back. And then on the IFC side, we can um, go in and start to work on feasibility studies, studies, start to work on how would we develop projects that could be bid out. And we've been doing this for years, as you know, Caroline, but um, it's, it's been sort of sporadic, it's taken too long, and we want to really scale this up. And a, a key part of this has been also identifying through what we call country private sector diagnostics, what are the sectors we should be focused on in a given country so we can be very specific with our public sector colleagues about what they need to do. And one really telling signal uh, this week um, was the, the least developed country ministerial that um, asked not just our Ida head, Aki Nishio from the World Bank to come and speak, but actually asked me and IFC to come and speak. They wanna hear what are we doing to bring the private sector back? So I think this is, it's exciting. It's something we haven't done before. It's a real shift in how we work going a bit further back, uh, not just waiting for projects to come our way, but really trying to work uh, to understand what it will take to bring the private sector back and then help get those reforms done and get the projects developed. So that's not traditional mobilization, but it's actually saying, you know, how do we get private sector solutions and, and solve this issue that we've all talked about for years around bankable projects. We need investable opportunities for the money that's now increasingly interested in impact uh, to, to, to tap those um, project opportunities so we can start solving the challenges. Thanks. Thank you very much, Karen. And, and you spoke about the need to get, what will it take to get the private sector to come back? Is it, is it de-risking? Is it policy reform? Is it bankable projects? If you, we've had this dialogue going past each other for years now. If you talk to people who have projects, they say we have a bankable and investable project. We can't get the money. Those with the money say there are, there's nothing to invest in. So I think it's great that you're going in that direction and also social and, and green, um, green bonds. But I wanted to come to Marc Andre um, to maybe ask, answer that that initial question of what will it take to get the private sector back? And also, um, are there specific innovations that you see as, as making the most sense from that private sector point of view? Well, uh, thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Caroline. And I'm um, so glad to be with Karen and some, so many friends this, uh, this morning. It's actually, for me, I was the ambassador of Canada to the UN and I co-chaired for four years the group of uh, financing the group of friends on financing the SDGs so I was on one side of the argument or uh, uh, you know one set of stakeholders in the UN and now I'm on the private sector side with a with a pension fund so it is uh, interesting and it's an eye-opener for me actually uh, to be sitting around the table and the investment uh, committee um, that uh, we have at, the, at La Caisse the Depot and Plasma du Québec so you know like La Caisse is, I'll talk to, about La Caisse. La Caisse is um, more or less, uh, it's, it's one of the biggest pension funds in the world. We are the third uh, largest player in, infra, in infrastructure. Uh, we, um, we are very, very strong, probably in renewable. We're probably, we are the leader in the world. The, and we have $10 billion of assets, uh, more or less, that are invested in, in, in directly in, and probably more, but like that, there's a bulk of $10 billion of assets uh, that are invested in, in emerging markets. Obviously, you know, the currency the situation flowing from COVID makes that these investments don't look, you know, as, um, uh, you know, like a, a, there's some issues with some of these investments. The the and and so this is why you saw so much so much of the capital going out in, from emerging markets. But how do you get to? Because this COVID crisis to me is will be for pension funds like ours. I think it, our positioning on on the ESG uh, uh, argument, La Caisse is very proactive on ESG. I think our game is pretty clear on the environment, very clear on governance. Um, 
the you know on on the environment you know we have 34 billion dollars of our of our assets that are invested in low carbon um asset the the issue so that's clear and and it, and i think the private sector is there on the environmental side on the climate side the issue now is will be how what will be the pressure following from this crisis on the s on the social side of ESG? And that to me, really, I'm, I'm talking now, I'm in between a, an observer, between the UN and the private sector now. So I'm really talking about that in between. I actually don't know where it's going to fall. And I think it's, all, it's up to us around this discussion here to actually try to define it and try to look at how we're going to do that. And you're asking, what's the magic bullet? There's no magic bullet. When I was at the UN, I argued a lot for what Karen has just said about the capacity building. It is the most important thing. I still believe that. On the other hand, let's not forget about the poll that you had. You know, in a, a as much as the case is 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 actually strong and a, a world leader in ESG on the pension fund side, we have our first obligation is the return uh, on investment for our pensioners. So. This is non-negotiable in our in 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 many ways, and so. But we believe we can have return, and we can actually do good. But we need to multiply the innovation. So there's no magic bullet, but also we need to be very creative in what we do. I'll give you an example. To to this week, we've announced a a a, a contribution of 125 million to a fund. It's interesting because it, you know um, the it was actually a part. It's part of a partnership we've developed with Creo uh, Family Office Syndicate, which is a nonprofit that is actually uh, that 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 you know seeks to capitalize new investments in clean energy and and transportation and sustainable food and agriculture and the like. So we now did a co-investment uh, part a partnership with a uh, S2G Ventures. So it's a it's a leading multi-stage investment firm. So you have this partnership with a nonprofit. Then we go and actually uh, we do a, an, a co-investment with a um, um, S2G Ventures to actually focus on sustainable agri-food business and and the likes. So this is one example. The other example that I have. Is is uh, is is actually from my, our own experience in Canada. We needed the infrastructure in Quebec, in Canada. We needed to build a train, and uh, nobody could do it alone. And there was so La Case came in as both an investor and a builder. But then that the, 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 this whole investment has actually been created through a platform of work with the government. And, and and green bonds played a big role in the financing of that uh, of that uh, infrastructure. So my point is, yes, it's done in a developed country, but we need to think about that sort of model that was completely unthinkable five years ago, even in ten in in developed markets. So the good news the good news for us at La Caisse is, you know, we want to double our portfolio of infrastructure in the next four years. So we want to go from uh, 27 billion to fi around 50 billion, and uh, throughout the world, and 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 that's there's an opportunity and there's room, but we actually need good projects, good partners, but we need we are willing to partner differently, and we need to multiply the platforms, and we need to have discussions. I mean, I've been arguing in Canada. I'll give you an example. Canada is a strong player in infrastructure. I've been saying to the government. Uh, when I was ambassador to the UN, and I hope they will do it, that actually we should get all of the members of the ecosystem and infrastructure in Canada, the engineering firms, the pension funds, the uh, the manufacturer, the, the, the technology, the, uh, the project developer, around the table with the government to have a global plan for Canada, for the, the, what is the Canadian plan to take on the world in infrastructure? And how, what do we need from the government? What do we need from the World Bank to play, to actually leverage ourselves as a Canadian uh, that we are so strong in infrastructure to play? And, and we will need all of these innovative tools because without it, uh, the risks are too high uh, and, and the returns are not there, unfortunately, at the moment in some, in some, in some frontier markets. So we, we, we will need to, 
but I think it's 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 we need to work on all of the legs of the stool at the same time right. because there's no one magic bullet and it's yeah. a series of things. It's capacity, it's working on the on the supply of money, working on the demand side, and it's it's all working together in a way we've not worked before because uh, I think uh, we will need the risking instruments. We will need uh, we will need uh, it, this is not disappearing, and uh, that's a certain. So I don't know if. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, uh, Marc Andre, and um, I think that um, it's a multi-legged stool, three-legged stool, maybe more than three legs. Oh, but yes, there's more. no silver, there's no silver bullet. I think it's a great way. Uh, we're ending the live stream now. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, a lot of food for thought there. I think you can follow up in in forums to keep questions coming. Would be great.